Hello and welcome. This is Notable, and as you can see, today we're discussing the theme of death in Dunn's poetry. We're going to begin the session today with some context. We'll talk about the visibility and prevalence of death in Dunn's day, before going on to describe the nature of Dunn's own death. This will lead us into an analysis of Holy Sonnet 6, this is my play's last scene. And then finally, for the sake of contrast, we'll take a look at Holy Sonnet 10, Death Be Not Proud, as this poem reflects a very different perspective on death and dying. So, let's get into it. Much of Dunn's poetry appears to be haunted by death. His other writings are also dominated by the subject. The last sermon he ever preached was titled Death's Jewel, for example. Now, though I think it would be fair to claim that Dunn had an unusually obsessive interest in death, even by the standards of his time, I think it's important to bear in mind that today we live in a world in which death is relatively hidden. It's a ghost which lurks in graveyards and hospitals, but generally speaking, not in everyday life. This wasn't the case in Dunn's day. In the 16th and 17th centuries, mortality rates were high, and without modern health care and vaccinations, people were defenceless against diseases such as smallpox and cholera. One in ten children died before their first birthday, and Dunn lost five of his children in infancy. In addition, this is also a time in which funerals were public, and executions were a spectacle for entertainment. In other words, death was very much a visible, everyday reality. John Dunn died on the 31st of March 1631, and it's clear that in the years leading up to his death, ideas, thoughts and concerns about God, the afterlife, salvation and divine judgment weighed heavily on his mind. In fact, almost his last act was to design the monument which was to stand over his grave in St Paul's Cathedral. For this, he drew a sketch of himself in his shroud and he supposedly kept this morbid drawing by his bed to remind himself of what he was soon to become. All of this serves to suggest that the prospect of death loomed over Dunn's life and lingered in his mind in the years leading up to 1631, and we certainly see this in his sixth holy sonnet, This Is My Play's Last Scene. As its title suggests, this sonnet confronts the prospect of death. Dunn addresses his impending demise, and expresses his desire to be received in heaven. The speaker believes that he has entered the final phase of his life, and the repetition of the word last stresses this sense of finality. Dunn uses a variety of images and metaphors to capture the impression of dwindling time, from a play's last scene to a minute's latest point. But notice how these images shrink in size as Dunn progresses through the sentence. We go from a mile to a mere pace, to an inch, and finally, to a point. So these shrinking images emphasise a sense of decline. Now, before we move on, notice how the sentence doesn't end after latest point. We have a semicolon instead of a full stop. In fact, the sentence is eight lines long. It persists across the entire length of the octave. Perhaps Dunn does this to enhance a sense of gathering speed. There are no full stops because Dunn's life is quickly ending. In this final phase of his life, there are no breaks or pauses for thought. In other words, the poem mirrors the pace of Dunn's life by quickly running to its end. In the second half of the octave, Dunn describes death, and the way in which he describes it conveys a profound sense of fear and terror. He describes death as gluttonous, for example, which suggests that death wants to devour or consume the speaker. He then writes that death will instantly unjoint him, and both these words are distinctly sinister. The adverb instantly suggests a terrifying and inhuman speed, whilst the verb unjoint connotes decapitation or mutilation. Overall, we get the impression that Dunn will be torn apart viciously and instantaneously by a gluttonous beast. Dunn then explicitly expresses his terror when he writes that fear already shakes my every joint, when he thinks of his soul, which he refers to as his ever-waking part, looking upon God. 
Indeed, Dunn is so afraid of looking upon God for the first time that he cannot even bring himself to refer to him by that title. Instead, he uses the vague phrase, that face. However, at the end of the octave, we finally have a full stop, and at the beginning of the next line, we have a volta, which signals a change in tone. Dunn suddenly becomes more hopeful. He imagines his soul ascending to heaven and abandoning his earth-born body on the earth. The speaker claims that his sins will fall away and return to hell, the place where they were bred, and in dropping off they purge him of evil. The final line is emphatic and confident. Dunn writes, For thus I leave the world, the flesh, the devil. So that volta between the octave and the sestet marks a change in attitude and perspective. Dunn transitions from fear to hope. This attitude of hope and confidence in the face of death is much more apparent in Holy Sonnet 10, Death Be Not Proud. For the sake of time, I'll move through this poem slightly faster. As you can see from the very first word of the poem, Dunn apostrophises death. He speaks directly to death as if death were a sentient human being. In other words, Dunn personifies death. The premise of the poem is that death is impotent. It's not powerful, because the dead will all reawake on Judgment Day, and death won't haunt humanity any longer. Now, Judgment Day, also known as the Day of Judgment or the Final Judgment, is the day on which Christians believe that God will judge all humanity, both the living and the dead. In the Bible, it's claimed that God has set a day in which he purposes to judge the inhabited earth. The earth will be destroyed, and everyone will be judged for their sins. But the really key part that you need to remember in relation to this sonnet is that the dead will be reawakened. So, speaking to death, Dunn writes that though some people believe that death is mighty and dreadful, this isn't really the case. The speaker seems to taunt death in the poem. He ironically refers to him as poor death and insists that it can't kill him. He goes on to claim that rest and sleep are pictures of death by which he means that they're very similar activities. They're like imitations of one another. Moreover, as rest and sleep are pleasurable activities, Dunn reasons that even more pleasure must flow from death. He elaborates on this by claiming that great men are currently resting in death, waiting for Judgment Day, which is the soul's delivery. He then diminishes death further by describing it as a slave to fate, chance, kings and desperate men. Death performs the bidding of these masters through the use of poison, war and sickness. Dunn mocks death by pointing out that poppy or charms, by which he means drugs and treatments, are more effective at putting people to sleep than death, and therefore death has no justification for his pride. Dunn asks, why swellst thou then? By which he means, why are you so proud? Finally, he returns to the subject of Judgment Day by pointing out that, after a short sleep, the souls of the dead will reawake and wake eternally. Death will no longer exist. He concludes with the emphatic words, Death, thou shalt die, which are reminiscent of the Bible. In 1 Corinthians, St Paul writes that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So it may well have been this line from Scripture which inspired this image of death as an enemy that will be destroyed. So ultimately, this poem is clearly characterised by a very different attitude from This Is My Play's last scene. We've moved from a poem which depicts death as a gluttonous beast that will instantly unjoint the speaker, to a sonnet which describes death as a powerless slave who will inevitably die itself. A comparison between these two poems would be really effective and useful if you're ever asked to discuss Dunn's attitude towards death. Anyway... This video marks the end of our thematic approaches to John Donne. Next time, we're going to be considering his characteristic use of conceits and symbolism. For now, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.